Hello class and welcome back to the second part of our lecture on the central nervous system as well as cranial nerves. Now, let's uh, shift our focus to the brain, the epicenter of thoughts, emotions, and actions, and explore how its structures shape our behavior and cognition. So, the brain often is referred to as the body's command center, as I've already mentioned, and it's really a marvel of complexity and organization. It houses billions of interconnected neurons in a very tightly and intricately networked system that really orchestrates every aspect of our existence. So let's take a look at some of the basic brain structures and some of their functions. So we'll look at the cerebral cortex, the limbic system, and the brain stem in this portion of our lecture. So the brain is divided into various regions, each with their own specific function. First off, the cerebral cortex is the outermost layer of the, the brain, and it is responsible for higher order functions like consciousness, reasoning, perception, and voluntary movement. And it's divided into two hemispheres, each further divided into four lobes. The frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and occipital lobe, uh, with distinct roles in processing different types of information. And in upcoming lectures, we will explore what those specific roles are. Next, there is something known as the limbic system, and this is the deep within the brain lies that limbic system, which plays a significant role in emotions and motivation and learning and memory. And it includes structures like the amygdala, which processes emotions, and the hippocampus, crucial for forming new memories. There is also the brain stem connecting the brain to the spinal cord and it is responsible for basic survival functions like heart rate and breathing and digestion. It's also involved in relaying sensory and motor signals between the brain and the rest of the body. And then of course there's hemispheric specialization, the left brain versus the right brain, and we've all heard of that at one time or another. And the concept of hemispheric specialization has really intrigued researchers for decades. While both hemispheres collaborate closely, they tend to have different strengths. You can almost think of them as different people in some ways. The left hemisphere is often associated with analytical and logical thinking, language processing and fine motor skills. Meanwhile, the right hemisphere is linked to creativity, uh, spatial perception, and emotional processing. Then of course, one of the brain's most remarkable acts attributes is plasticity. For a long time it was believed that when the brain structure was formed uh, in early childhood that it stayed that way. But we've come to learn that it does have a limited ability to reorganize and adapt. And this means that our brains can change on a limited basis in response to experiences and learning and even injury. And so neural pathways can strengthen with repeated use, while unused pathways may weaken or be pruned away, especially in early childhood. And both plasticity and the uh, ability to recover allows us to acquire new skills and adjust to changes and recover from certain injuries. So to illustrate the fascinating concept of brain, brain plasticity, I want to kind of just delve into a little story, uh, a true story about Michael Merzenich. 
uh, a neuroscientist who played a pivotal role in understanding the brain's remarkable ability to rewire itself. Now, in the 1980s, uh, Michael Merzenich, who was a, a neuroscientist from the University of California, embarked on a groundbreaking journey to explore the brain's uh, abilities. And he focused on the auditory system and its connections to the brain. And Merzenich uh, conducted experiments on owl monkeys, aiming to understand how the brain processes sound. And Merzenich's team exposed the monkeys to auditory stimuli and recorded the responses of neurons in the brain. And what they discovered was really quite astonishing. As the monkeys were repeatedly exposed to specific sounds, the neurons that responded to those sounds became more finely tuned. In other words, the monkeys' brains were rewiring themselves in response to the sensory input that they were receiving. Building on these findings, Bruzenek developed a concept known as neuroplasticity. And this concept challenged the prevailing belief that the brain's structure and functions were fixed after a certain age. And Merzenek demonstrated that the brain could change its own wiring in response to experiences, a phenomenon he referred to as brain plasticity. And Merzenek's work has had a profound impact on our understanding of brain development and learning and rehabilitation. His research paved the way for therapies that harness brain plasticity to treat conditions like stroke, learning disorders, and hearing impairments. For example, he was involved in the development of cochlear implants, devices that can restore hearing in individuals with certain types of hearing loss. And Michael Merzenich's story showcases the incredible potential of the brain to adapt and change throughout life. And his groundbreaking research not only revolutionized the field of neuroscience, but also opened up new avenues for enhancing human potential and improving the quality of life for individuals facing neurological challenges. So, very fascinating aspects of the brain, and particularly the cortex and the limbic system and the brainstem. Let's go on now and take a look at cranial nerves, which is a fascinating part of the brain's structure and function, because these are vital messengers that connect our brain to various parts of our head and our neck. So within cranial nerves and the whole realm of cranial nerves are a network of 12 specialized nerves directly emerging from the brain. And these nerves play an essential role in conveying information between the brain and various regions of the head and neck. And they're like communication cables that enable us to perceive sensory information, control facial expressions, and carry out essential functions. And the cranial nerves are really a set of nerves that originate directly from different areas of the brain, as opposed to coming through the spinal cord. And they exit the skull through various openings and innervate different parts of the head and face and neck. And each cranial nerve has its specific pathway and territory of influence. So the cranial nerves can be categorized based upon their function. Remember, there's 12 overall, but we can kind of break it down a little bit simpler. We can have the motor cranial nerves, and these nerves primarily control the various uh, movements of muscles. For example, the facial nerve which is the cranial nerve uh, seven, controls facial expressions, while the hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve 12, controls tongue movements. Then there's sensory cranial nerves. And these nerves transmit sensory information from various sensory receptors to the brain. For instance, the optic nerve 
which is cranial nerve 2, carries visual information from the eyes to the brain, allowing us to see and perceive our surroundings. And then there are mixed cranial nerves. And these nerves have both motor and sensory functions. So, for example, the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, for example, plays a crucial role in controlling the heart rate and digestive processes, while also carrying sensory information from the organs to the brain. And cranial nerves really are usually assigned Roman numerals, so um, from 1 to 12, based on their order of exit from the brain, starting from the front and moving towards the back of the brain. And each cranial nerve has a specific name that reflects its function and the region it innervates. Uh, the names also carry clues about their roles and their functions. And understanding the functions and roles of these 12 cranial nerves is essential in diagnosing and treating various neurological and sensory disorders. And whether it's allowing you to enjoy the taste of your favorite meal or recognize familiar faces or simply to smile in response to a joyful moment, Cranial nerves are really the silent orchestrators of our daily experiences. So I just want to kind of delve into each one of these cranial nerves so you get a little bit more of a sense of what we're talking about. First one is the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve one, and its function is sensory. And it is responsible for our sense of smell, transmitting olfactory information from the nasal cavity to the brain. And it's a nerve that actually runs right across the top of your, fo uh, in your forehead. And so um, it, uh, and that's why it's cranial nerve one, because it right starts at the front. And we have optic nerve, the, the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two. And that, again, that's a sensory nerve. And it carries visual information from the retina of the eye to the brain, allowing us to perceive and interpret our visual stimuli. Then there is oculomotor nerve, which is cranial nerve three. And this is a motor nerve and it controls the movement of the eye muscles responsible for things like eye movement, pupil constriction, and lens accommodation. Then we have the trochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve four, and that's a motor nerve, and it controls the superior oblique muscles, which rotate the eye downward and outward. Then we have cranial nerve five, and which is the trigeminal nerve, and this is both motor and sensory and its function is to be responsible for sensory input from the face and control of the muscles involved in chewing. Then we have cranial nerve six, which is a motor nerve and this controls the latter uh, reculus muscle responsible for the outward eye movement. Then we have the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve seven. And that is a motor and sensory nerve and it controls facial expressions and also carries some taste sensations from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Then we have the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve eight, and that's a sensory nerve, and that comprises of two branches, the vestibular, which is your balance and spatial orientation, and the cochlear, which is your auditory and hearing. Then we have the glossopharyngeal nerve, the, which is cranial nerve nine, and that is a 
motor and a sensory nerve. It controls swallowing. It carries taste sensation from the posterior one third of the tongue. And it also interestingly monitors blood pressure and oxygen levels. Then we have our vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10. And that is both a motor and sensory nerve. And it's involved in a wide range of functions, including controlling heart rate and digestion and various involuntary muscles. Then we have an accessory nerve, which is cranial nerve 11. That's a motor nerve. And it controls muscles involved in our head and shoulder movement. And then finally, our hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve 12, is a motor nerve and it controls the muscles of the tongue, enabling speech and, of course, swallowing. And each of these cranial nerves, I hope you see, plays a unique and crucial role in our sensory perception, or our motor control, and our overall physiological function. So very important to be appreciative of those cranial nerves. So let's dive in a little bit deeper and get a closer look at some of the cranial nerves. First off, I want to take a look at uh, cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, and unmask some of the intricacies of the facial nerve. Because it's a cranial nerve with uh, multifaceted functions that contribute to both our expressions and our sensory experiences. So the facial nerve, known as the cranial nerve seven, is really a remarkable nerve that has a long and intricate pathway. It originates in the pons region in the brain stem and the facial nerve courses its way through the skull, passing through narrow openings it then branches out extensively to innervate various muscles, facial muscles, and transmit sensory information. And this complex pathway allows the facial nerve to serve as a vital link between the brain and the muscles of facial expression, as well as certain sensory structures within the tongue. And so it has that dual function of motor and control and taste sensation. So the facial nerve is unique in that way in that it carries both motor and sensory functions. On the motor side, it controls the muscles of facial expression. So every smile and frown and squint you make is a result of the facial nerve's intricate coordination of these muscles. But that's not all. The facial nerve also carries taste sensations from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So the ability to savor the flavors of your favorite foods is made possible by these nerves sensory components. Now, this is something that we've already talked a little bit about. I want to kind of just explore the intricate nerves and how they can uh, face some challenges. Then one well-known condition associated with facial nerves is Bell's palsy. And Bell's palsy is typically a sudden temporary paralysis or weakness of the facial muscles affecting usually one side of the face. And this condition can lead to difficulty in closing one eye, smiling or making facial expressions. And the exact cause of Bell's palsy is still not fully understood, but it's thought to be related to inflammation or viral infections that affect the facial nerve. And the symptoms can be distressing and might cause difficulties in communication and emotional expression. And treatment for Bell's palsy often involves managing the underlying cause, providing supportive care and sometimes using medications to reduce inflammation and to promote some nerve recovery. In most cases, the condition improves over time and the facial nerve regains gradually its function. Now, 
let's delve into a real world story that sheds light on the impact of Bell's palsy on a well-known individual. So <clears throat> the story of Justin Bieber comes to mind here. And Justin Bieber, of course, is that Canadian globally recognized pop sensation, but he's not immune to the challenges that affect everyone. And so back in 2013, it was reported that Bieber faced a health setback when he was diagnosed with Bell's palsy. And this revelation really stunned his fans and brought attention to this often misunderstood condition. And at the time, Bieber's manager shared that the artist was experiencing weakness and in immobility on one side of his face, which are classic symptoms of Bell's palsy. And this diagnosis led to the concern about his ability to perform, as facial expressions are a significant part of a performer's communication with the audience. And despite these challenges, uh, Bieber remained resilient and he acknowledged his condition and with the support of his fans and some medical interventions he gradually started recovering from the effects of Bell's palsy and over time his condition improved and he was able to regain his trademark smile and to continue on with his music journey. Let's then take a look at the optic nerve, the cranial nerve 2, as the optic nerve really kind of takes the center stage as the conduit through which we perceive the vivid tapestry of the world around us. So the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, plays that pivotal role of visual perception. So it originates in the back of each eye where the nerve fibers gather to form the optic nerve, uh, the optic nerve head, also known as the optic disc. And this is the spot where the nerve exits the eye, creating a small blind spot in your visual field. So if you were to move your eye around and keep your eye focus in one spot, you would notice that the tip of your finger would tend to disappear out of your visual frame for a period of time. And the optic nerve carries visual information from the retina to each eye, uh, from each eye to the brain. And then this allows us to interpret the images that we see. And so it's a very complex structure that involves really over a, a million nerve fibers which are all bundled together in that optic nerve. And that serves as that communication channel for transmitting the visual signals. So the visual pathway is from the retina back to the visual cortex. And so this journey of visual information begins in the retina with specialized cells called photoreceptors. And those capture light and convert it to electrical signals. And these signals are then relayed through various layers of retinal cells until they reach the ganglion cells. And the axons of these ganglion cells come together to form the optic nerve, which carries the signals to the brain. And so the optic nerve fibers from each eye partially cross over at a point called the optic chiasm, or the suprachiasmic gap and this crossover ensures that the information from both sides of the visual field are integrated into each hemisphere of the brain. So from the optic chiasm the visual signals travel along the optic tract to reach the visual cortex at the back of the brain and here the brain processes and, and assembles the visual information into the images and scenes that we then perceive. Now, while the optic nerve plays a critical role in vision, it can also be susceptible to various disorders that can really impact visual perception. And one well-known condition is glaucoma, a, a group of eye diseases that damage the optic nerve due to increased intraocular pressure. And this damage can lead to visual field loss and even blinded 
if, uh, blindness if left untreated. Another disorder is optic neuritis, which involves inflammation of the optic nerve. And this is often caused by autoimmune conditions such as multiple sclerosis. An optic neuritis can result in vision loss and color desaturation and even pain when moving the eyes. Now, I want to just kind of delve again into a bit of a true story that highlights the impact of optic neuritis in a well-known individual. And for this story, we're going to look at the American journalist and news anchor Tom Brokaw. Now, for some of you, you may never have heard of Tom Brokaw, but he historically has been a uh, very famous news personality with a big booming voice and a commanding presence. And he, for decades, he was the news anchor for NBC News in the United States. Anyways, he faced a health challenge that really sheds the light on the significance of the optic nerve and visual perception. In the late 1990s, Brokaw experienced symptoms that included vision problems and eye pain and even color desaturation. And these symptoms led to a uh, diagnosis for him of optic neuritis. And optic neuritis is often associated with multiple sclerosis or other autoimmune diseases that affect the central nervous system. And Brokaw's diagnosis really raised awareness about the connection between optic neuritis and underlying neurological conditions. Now for Brokaw, the experience was not only a health challenge, but also an opportunity to share a story and raise awareness of the importance of eye health and neurological well-being. And so he discussed his diagnosis openly and used his platform on the news to educate others about optic neuritis and its potential connection to conditions like MS. Now, in Brokaw's case, there was proper medical care and treatment, and Brokaw's condition did improve over time. But his journey really kind of highlights the importance of early diagnosis and medical intervention and the support that people can get from healthcare professionals. So let's just take a look at uh, some key terms for, for, for this week, just, just to kind of be mindful of some of the vocabulary that it will be important to remember. So first off, we have the nervous system, and the nervous system is the body's communication network made up of specialized cells called neurons, and it controls and coordinates various functions, including thinking and sensing and movement and bodily processes. Now within the nervous system, there is the central nervous system, the C and S. And the central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. And it's like the control center of the body, responsible for processing information and making decisions and sending signals to the rest of the body. And then we have the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. And the peripheral nervous system connects the central nervous system to the rest of the body. And it includes all the nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord and helps transmit signals between the central nervous system and different body parts. Then there are neurons. And neurons are specialized cells in the nervous system that transmit information using electrical and chemical signals. They're like messengers relaying messages from different parts of the body and the brain. Then, of course, we have the brain. What is the brain? The brain is the command center of the body, responsible for thinking and memory and emotions and controlling bodily function. It's where complex thoughts, perceptions, and behaviors originate, contained in the skull. And then there are cranial nerves. We've talked about the cranial nerves. And cranial nerves are a set of 12 nerves that emerge directly 
from the brain and connect to various parts of the head and neck and organs. And they play a crucial role in functions like seeing and hearing and tasting and even controlling facial expressions. So, overall, in today's lecture, we've embarked on a really fascinating journey, I think, where we've looked at the nervous system and the intricate network of cranial nerves. We began by unraveling the fundamentals of the nervous system, the body's remarkable communication network composed of neurons. And this system governs our thoughts and emotions and movements and bodily functions. And our exploration then led us to the central nervous system, the CNS, consisting of the brain and spinal cord. And the CNS serves as the command center, processing information, making decisions, and sending out instructions. We delved into the peripheral nervous system, connecting the CNS to the rest of the body and facilitating communication. The heart of our lecture really centered on the diverse and indispensable cranial nerves. And these 12 specialized nerves emerge directly from the brain and play roles that range from transmitting sensory information to controlling facial expression. Each cranial nerve has its own unique function, contributing to our sensory perceptions, motor control, and overall physiological well-being. And we've also explored the intricacies of spe specific cranial nerves, including the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, responsible for facial expressions and taste sensation. We learned about Justin Bieber's experience with Bell's palsy, shedding light on that real-world impact of these nerves on famous individuals. We also dived into the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, the gateway to the visual world. And the optic nerve carries visual information from the eyes to the brain, allowing us to perceive the vivid tapestry of our surroundings. We examined its structure, the visual pathway it follows, and common disorders that can affect it. And continuing our exploration, we then delved into the captivating world of brain function and plasticity. And the brain, often likened to the body's control center, orchestrates our thoughts and emotions and behaviors. So it's a complex network of neurons and structures, each with distinct roles and functions. We looked at the cerebral cortex, divided into lobes, how it handles conscious thought and voluntary movement. We looked at the limbic system, which governs emotions and motivation and memory and the brainstem, which oversees our essential survival functions like breathing and heart rate. And we discussed a little bit about hemispheric specialization, where the left and the right hemispheres have distinct strengths in processing information. And we also looked at plasticity, that ability to reorganize and adapt. And along our journey, we have explored and realized that there are some awe-inspiring stories associated with the brain. And overall, within all of these complexities, we can appreciate just how fearfully and wonderfully made that we are. And that's going to conclude our lecture for this week. Hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next week. You take care. Goodbye.
Thank you.